Um, okay, so all you need to do for next time, right, is read the selection from Thomas Hobbes. Um, it's about five pages and submit at least three words you had to look up to the vocab folder, right? I'm going to warn everybody to go slowly and carefully with this and to maybe read it more than once because this is 17th century English prose, so it's a little bit, uh, it gets a little bit gnarled, right? So just, you know, if you, know, if you have to go slowly with it, do so. That's probably the best way um, to handle it. Um, a couple of you are taking American government, right? Have you guys talked about Hobbes at all in that class? Is the name familiar at all? Okay, so Hobbes is one of the uh, originators of an idea called social contract theory. Does this sound familiar to anybody? I heard somebody murmur in assent. Okay, James, what, do you, what is social contract theory? Like, um, it's not a tangible contract, it's something that you Yeah, right, that, that government requires an agreement between the ruler and the ruled, right? And that if either side breaks their part of the contract, the contract is considered void, right? Now, Hobbes's version of the social contract is a little bit more authoritarian than um, later versions of the contract that, uh, will, that, that are theorized by people like John Locke and Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Um, those are the things that are more directly influential on American government. But they're both drawing on and in dialogue with Thomas Hobbes here. So Hobbes is also going to have a lot to do with, or is, is going to be in dialogue with Tafik al-Hakim as well, and the stuff that Hakim al-Hakim is talking about in this play. So does anybody have any questions about anything before we get started with The Sultan's Dilemma? Everybody good? Okay, great. So this is, again, like just a short excerpt from a much longer play. How did this go for you? What did you think? Okay, so you had a little bit more trouble with the like. So, what, what, like, can you give me an example? Like, what, what kinds of words were giving you uh, difficulty? Uh, I had never heard of. Uh, what's that? Manumit or something like that. Okay, manumit and manumission. Yeah, I never heard of that. Okay. I mean, I, I know what it means now. But yeah. So yeah, these are words that refer to freeing a slave, right? Right, other um, related words to this, right? The word chattel refers, generally speaking, to a living thing that is property, right? So it's, it, refer, it refers both to livestock and was also sometimes used to refer to slaves, right? Okay, so there was, yeah, there, there was some, some thorny language in this. Um, anything else that you guys have questions about or that you had difficulty with, or even just that you found interesting? What's the central problem here? What is the dilemma that the title here refers to? The sultan was bought by the previous sultan. And yeah. But was never freed, so he's technically still a slave. Yeah, so what the situation we have here is 
the Sultan, who was never actually named here, none of the characters are named, they're all just given titles that indicate their particular position. Yeah, the Sultan, unbeknownst to himself, was born a slave, he was purchased by the previous Sultan, raised as his son, but never manumitted, right? Never set free. So what does this mean about the Sultan's position? Now who does he know? So since his adopted father slash master died without other heirs, who does he belong to? The state. Yeah, he belongs to the state, right? The Sultan is literally here property of the state. So what are the two solutions here that are offered to resolve this? What are the two possible things he could do to resolve this situation? He could um, execute a slave or the person that said this. Yeah. Go up for option and hope to be free. Or, well, not Yeah. The first thing he can do is execute the person who knows the secret. The second thing he can do is put, him, put himself up for public auction so that whoever purchases him and then set him free, right? So how does the, what terms does the Qadi use, the judge, to refer to these two options? The sword and the law. Yeah. Option one is the option of the sword. Right? You could just kill the person who's put you in this position, right? Option two is the option of the law, right? That the Sultan is subject to the laws of the state like everyone else and acknowledges that he must obey them, right? So what's the difference? So what does the what, what does the sultan show about himself and how he views his own authority if he chooses the path of the sword? May I please repeat your question? Sure. So what? How do we how do we get us how do we know how the sultan views his idea of royal authority if he chooses this first path, the path of the sword? What does that suggest about the kind of ruler he wants to be or thinks he is? He'll kill the people who this way? Yeah. He'll use violence to enforce his own will, right? So what do we usually what do we usually call a leader like that? Tyrant. Yeah, a tyrant, right? Dictator. Right? <clears throat> Autocrat. Right? Somebody who simply uses the fact that he is the most powerful person in the state to throw his weight around and make other people do what he wants, right? Now, what if he chooses the other path? Then what does that say about him and how he views 
Um, the meaning of leadership. He respects the people in the world? Yeah. It shows respect for the people. something going like going on here as well it does have to do with honesty right so can they auction the Sultan off privately where does it have to be done in yeah it has to be a public auction right in order to satisfy the law right the vizier can't just say oh well I'll buy him and then I'll set him free and then that um, you know makes the problem go away it has to be a public auction now, does the execution of the person who knows the Sultan's secret have to be public? No. In fact, because it, he's trying to hide exactly, it. yeah, so it be, yeah, yeah, to know that he killed him. yeah, exactly. It had better not be right if it's going to work. So, here we have this: the path of the sword also ends up here being a path of secrecy and deceit, right? Yeah, they're staying private or going public. Yeah. Let's just keep this between us versus right. Let's be honest about this and let's be transparent, right? So <clears throat> to give you a little bit of uh, context for this play and for what's going on here, right? So, the play is set in a kind of generalized medieval Egypt, but it's written in 1960, right? So the author of the play, uh, Tawfiq al-Hakim, is one of the best known Egyptian um, playwrights and novelists of the mid 20th century. So he's born in 1898 and dies in 1987 and lives through um, a couple of periods of dictatorship in Egypt. So Al Hakim is a supporter of the 1952 revolution. In Egypt, in which um, army officers who call themselves the free officers depose King Farouk of Egypt. Um, they do this for a couple of reasons, right? One, they intend to set up a republic. Two, they want to get rid of the British presence in Egypt, right? They want to decolonize the country. And they want to completely abolish the monarchy as an institution, right? So their initial stated goal was to get rid of the king, get rid of the old colonize, the last traces of the old colonizing power, and to set up a democratically elected socialist government. Right, probably envisioning something like more along the lines of Norway or Sweden or Denmark and not so much along the lines of like the old Soviet Union, right? Envisioning, I'm saying here. It's not really what happened. So 
One of the leaders of this revolution, Gamal Abdel Nasser, uh, is elected president in 1956. And Nasser is actually a huge fan of Al-Hakim's work, right? Al-Hakim is one of his favorite writers. Um, so he really admires, uh, <clears throat> he really admires this guy. Um, and under Nasser, Egypt undergoes a process of modernization, right? There are huge building campaigns Right? They build um, an enormous dam in Aswan. Um, there's an attempt to you know, like kind of modernize and update um, old buildings in the cities and to industrialize the uh, Egyptian economy. Um, alongside these reforms are also economic reforms that include the nationalization of key industries. Does anybody know what it means to nationalize an industry? Okay, James, what does it mean if you're nationalizing an industry? Um, so like if, uh, if there's like coal mines in a country, the government, and by extension the people own yeah. the government, or take control of the company. Yeah, so at least theoretically, right, the people own the company and the state administers, on, administers it on their behalf, right? And the proceeds, the profits the company makes are then supposed to go back into the country, right? Um, <clears throat> you can look at a, like a place where this actually, like where this works the way it's supposed to. If you look, for example, at Norway and the profits they make from the North Sea oil fields, um, that are then reinvested into things like education and infrastructure, right? Um, what Nasser does, which provokes a huge in international response, is he nationalizes the Suez Canal, uh, which is a major, uh, a major point of passage for, the, for transporting oil and had previously been under British control. So he seizes it for Egypt and says this is going to be administered by the state now. So this provokes a war first between Egypt and Israel and then between Egypt, Britain, and France, right? All of whom want access to the canal, all of whom want control of the canal, right? Now, in response to this crisis, one of the things that Nasser starts doing is cracking down on the civil rights of citizens of Egypt, right? One of the first things he does, for example, when Israel attacks is uh, essentially take away all the legal protections enjoyed by uh, Jewish citizens of Egypt. Right, reduces them to the status of about you know second or third class citizens. So, <clears throat> what this illustrates here is kind of how in Hakim's own time, around the time that Al Hakim was writing this play, he was seeing this government crisis play out, and might lead one to think a good bit about. good government and government authority, right, and what the government owes to the people and how the government should relate to or respond to the people, right? Um, so Al-Hakim was influenced by a German playwright by the name of Bertolt Brecht. Anybody ever heard of Brecht before? Anybody familiar with Brecht? 
Anybody read uh, read a Brecht play in high school? Or... No, we don't know Brecht. Okay. So Brecht had started out as a writer in Germany in the late 1920s. And over the course of the 30s, as he's watching um, the rise of fascism in his own country, um, he begins writing an increasingly political drama that is meant to get people to kind of detach from the action of the play and try to consider the arguments the play is making instead, right? To try to regard the play intellectually. So these are called alienation effects. And essentially what these alienation effects do is remind you that you're watching a play so that you don't get too deeply emotionally involved with the characters or with the action, right? So the kinds of things that Brecht would typically um, include in a play, right? The, the, the sorts of things he would include in the staging, right? Would be things like uh, actors playing multiple roles. Right? So you've got, you know, maybe you know, an actor is killed, you know, a character is killed in one scene and then the same actor comes back in the next wearing a different hat and is a different person, right? It's clear to the audience that this is the same actor, but this way they, they don't connect the actor with the character, right? Do you all know what breaking the fourth wall is? Yes. Okay, explain. Isn't that's potentially when they're not interacting with the crowd, but like, they're facing the crowd, they're trying to project towards the crowd, and they're not acting like they're not there. Yeah, it's basically like when an actor kind of breaks out of the scene and starts talking to the audience, right? Acknowledging that the audience is there. It's like, hey, there are people watching this play, right? And I'm going to talk to you now and not to the other characters in the play. So I used to have to do that. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, starting in the early 20th century, it's a, an increasingly common feature in plays. Yeah. Um, another thing that you might see is the reorganization of the set and even costume changes. being done in front of the audience. Right, so if an actor is switching characters or switching costumes, right, especially if they're switching characters, they just change right there on stage, right? I'm in a different costume, a different character now. Um, you know, the, the actors might like, you know, carry off set pieces with them and then bring new set pieces back on when the new scene starts, right? And finally, and this is what's most relevant, I'm saving this for last, because it's most relevant to what Al-Hakim is doing, is historicization. Right, that is, you set the play in a historical period other than the one you actually want to comment on. Right? So to give you an example of this, right? Um, Brecht's late 1930s play, Mother Courage and Her Children, is specifically about the threat of war engulfing all of Europe in, you know, say 1938, 1939, right? So, there would actually have been a recent historical precedent for that, right? If Brecht is worried about a massive pan-European war in 1938, what would be his most obvious historical reference point? World War I. Yeah, there had just been one 20 years prior, right? But if he wants people to step back emotionally from the action, 
and consider the arguments of the play, why would World War I be a bad choice? Because the Germans lost World War I. Partly because they lost, sure. But why else might it be a bad choice? So we're talking about emotional investment here. Because they probably lost their memory. Exactly, yeah. It's still in living memory, right? And so people in the audience, they you know, might be war veterans, they might have lost family members in the war, they might have lost homes in the war, right? Um, so people would have emotional involvement with the First World War. So what he does is set the play instead in a 17th century religious conflict that is similar in a lot of ways to the First World War, the Thirty Years' War, um, but that people don't have particularly strong emotional feelings about in 1939, right? Because nobody alive remembers it. It's something that happens in a history book, right? Al-Hakim is doing the same thing here, right? He's commenting on contemporary politics, but he's doing it by referring to a past period. And I think that we can probably see something, I think we'll probably see some direct analogs between what was going on in the late 50s in Egypt and what's going on at the beginning of what was called the Mamluk Sultanate. So do any of you know, do any of y'all know what a Mamluk is? A slave. Yeah. Literally, a Mamluk was a slave. In fact, the Mamluks were non-Arab elite slave soldiers. in medieval Egyptian armies. And by the end of the ninth century, they become the dominant force in the Egyptian army, and on top of that, have also obtained influence at the Sultan's court. Right, they're still technically slaves, but they have become extremely powerful and influential slaves. Now, in the year 1250, they take advantage of the chaos brought by the Crusades. to depose an unpopular sultan. There's a guy by the name of Turan Shah. And then the Mamluks end up ruling Egypt until 1517. So, in what ways does this narrative resemble the narrative of the 1952 revolution? How are these events similar to each other? They overthrow a 
monarchy. Yeah, both involves the overthrow of a monarchy, right? Are there other similarities here as well? Who were the leaders of the 1952 revolution? Egyptians? Egyptians, yeah. But what class of people do they come from? Like, what, what's their occupation? Of the army. Yeah, it's a, it's a military coup, right? In both cases. It's the army revolting, deposing the king, and then taking over, right? Now, there was no talk of setting up a republic in the Mamluk Sultanate, right? There were no you know, gestures in that direction. Well, you know, that was what was kind of supposed to be happening in 1952, and what probably could have happened if things went a little differently, right? But, <clears throat> The other thing I think we might want to think about as well here, right, is what created the conditions for the Mamluks to take over? Oh, a tyrannical or an unpopular sultan. Yeah, you had a tyrannical, unpopular sultan, and Yeah, you also had foreign invasion, right? And one of the things that the free officers movement was particularly opposed to was the continued British presence in Egypt, right? So in both cases, you've got European interlopers, right? Who have made themselves unpopular in the country. So. Al-Hakim is using this act, like he is specifically drawing on these particular historical similarities to make points about the historical situation, the, the, the contemporary situation in 1960, right? Like, so let's talk about Egypt circa 1400, but apply it to Egypt in 1960, right? And so let's look at the way these three characters here break down their arguments regarding what the Sultan needs to do. So who does most of the talking here? Which of these characters seems to have the most to say? The Kadi. Yeah. Yeah, the Kadi I think does yeah, does most of the talking. And what is the Kadi's basic argument? Bearing in mind, again, that what the Qadi in Arabic means judge. That the Sultan needs to follow the law? Yeah, the Sultan needs to follow the law, right? So he lays out both options for the Sultan, right? But his advice is that the Sultan needs to follow the law. What about the Vizier? 
A vizier is something more like a prime minister, uh, but liter in Arabic it literally translates to uh, one who bears burdens. So you know, one who you know carries the weights that the ruler shouldn't have to, right? What does the vizier seem to want? The sword. Okay, yeah, the sword. Or at the very least, to extricate the sultan. from this situation privately, right, without embarrassment. Now, I think it might help to understand these characters' positions if we kind of go through some of this together. And since this is a play, we may, we may as well assign a couple of roles. Can I get a volunteer to read the part of the Kadi? Yeah, okay, be the Kadi. And I also need a Sultan. Don't make me pick somebody. You can see y'all avoiding eye contact. James, will you read the Sultan for us? Yes. Thank you. Okay. So we'll just start on page 343 here, right? With this first, the, the first thing, owing to the fact that in the eyes of the law. Owing to the fact that in the eyes of the law, you are a ch chattel, ch chattel? Mm -hmm. yep. owned by the late Sultan, you have become part of his inheritance. And as he died without leaving an heir, his estate reverts to the ex ex exchequer, right? So it's sent it to the state treasury. You are thus one of the chattels owned by the ex I can't say it. An unproductive chattel yielding to no profit or return. I, in my additional capacity as treasurer of the Exchequer. How is it pronounced? Ex Exchequer. Ex Exchequer? Yep. Okay. Say so it is the custom as such case to get rid of an unprofitable chattel by putting them up for sale at auction so that the good interest of the exchequer be not harmed and so that it may utilize the proceeds of the sale in bringing benefit to the people generally and in particular to the poor. An unproductive chattel, I? I'm speaking for strictly from the legal point of view. Up until now, I have obtained no solutions from you. All I have had are insults. Insults, I beg your pardon. Uh, illustration, Sultan. You know very well how much I revere and admire you, and in what high esteem I told you, I hold you. You will recollect no doubt that it was I who from the first moment was the one to come forward to pay you homage. Homage, yep. And proclaim you as a sultan to rule over our country. What I am now doing is merely to give a frank review of the situation from the point of view of civil and religious law. The long and short of it is then that I am a thing and a chattel and not a man or a human being. Yes. And that this thing or chattel is owned by the exchequer. Indeed. And that the exchequer disposes of unproductive chattels by putting them up for sale at auction for the public good. Exactly. Oh, Chief Cody, don't you feel as I do that this is all extraordinarily bizarre? Yes, but... And that there's a great deal of undue exaggeration and extravagance in it all? Maybe, but in my capacity is, well, how is it pronounced? That's Kadi. Kadi. What concerns me is where the facts stand in relation to the process of the law. Listen, Kadi. This law of yours has brought me no solution, whereas a small movement of my sword will ensure that the knot of the problem is severed instantly. Then do so. Okay, so pause here for a second, right? So in addition to the Kadi kind of laying out what the legal situation is here, for the soul, right? What else do we notice about the way he refers to himself and his own opinions in this process? 
How does he always claim to be speaking? In respect, right? Yeah, he's speak, trying. He's speak, you know, with all due respect, sir, right? But does his purpose seem to be to humiliate the soul? Does he seem to have any personal grudge against the soul? The sultan's taking everything personally, right? But what does the Qadi keep insisting about the advice that he's giving? Yeah, factual objective, right? And is he offering his views as a private citizen or his views as a public official? Public official. Yeah, he's keeping those two things separate here, right? You know, remember something like I was, you know, I was the first one to do you homage, right? I was the first one to come up and bow down to you, right? I don't have anything against you. I am speaking entirely in my role here as a judge, right? As a legal expert and public official. Sultan continues to insist on taking things personally, right? And <clears throat> if we look at you know this you know uh, this quote and heard the long and short of it is then that I'm a thing and a chattel and not a man or a human being, right? What is the thing that really seems to upset him about all? Yeah, that this decision, right, if he abides by what the Qadi says, it makes him a thing and not a person, right? And the only way to become not a thing is to allow himself to be purchased and the proceeds then distributed for the public good, right? So the sultan here is, I think, not at all coincidentally, not only subject to the law here, right, but subject to the people and to the goodwill of the people. So if he draws his sword and cuts the head off of the guy who knows the secret of the Qadi, who does that benefit? Solely himself, right? However, if he follows the law and puts himself up for auction, as weird as this sounds, right? You know, is this, this sort of thing benefiting anybody? Who ultimately benefits? The people. Yeah, it's a, a matter of private or public benefit, right? So he is being asked to sacrifice something of his dignity and even of his freedom, right, for the good of his people. So can we continue here, starting on top of page 344, can I also get somebody to read the vizier, since the vizier starts talking now?
Brandon, can you read the vizier for us? Thank you. Yes. So we're, oh, oh, we're we're actually we're, we're we're starting with the sultan, but when it comes to the vizier, so let's start with um, I shall. What does the spilling of a little blood? I shall. What does the spilling of a little blood matter for the sake of the practicability of government? Then you must start by spilling my blood. I shall do everything I think necessary for safeguarding the security of the state, and I shall in fact start with you. I shall cast you into prison, vizier. Arrest the caddy. Your Majesty, you have not yet listened to his answer to your question. What question? The question about the solution he deems appropriate for the problem. He answered this question. What he said was not the solution, but a review of the situation. Is that true, Cody? Yes. Have you then a solution to this problem of ours? Yes. Then speak. What is the solution? There is only one solution. Say, what is it? That the law be applied. Again? Once more? Yes, once more and always, for I see no other solution. Do you hear, Vizier? After this, do you entertain any hope of cooperation with this stubborn old windbag? Allow me, Your Majesty, to interrogate him a little. Do as you like. Oh, Chief Caddy, the question is a subtle one, and it requires you to explain to us clearly in detail your point of view. My point of view is both clear and simple, and I can propound in it in two words. For the solution of this problem, we have before us two alternatives, that of the sword and that of the law. As for the sword, that is not of my concern. As for the law, that is what it be behoves me to recommend and on which I can give a legal opinion. The law says, it is only as master the processor of the power of life and death over him, who has the right to manumit? Manumit, yep. A slave, a slave. In this instant, the master, the processor of the power of life and death, died without leaving an heir in the, in the ownership of the slave he re reverted to exchequer. The exchequer may not manumit him without the compensation in that no one has the right to dispose greatest mm -hmm. of property or chattels belonging to the state. It is however permitted that for the exchequer to make a disposition by sale and the selling of the property of state is not valid by law other than by an auction carried out publicly. The legal solution therefore is that we should put up His Majesty the Sultan for sale by public auction and the person whom he is knocked down thereafter mani manumits. manumits him. In the manner the extra is not harmed or defra defrauded in respect of his property and the Sultan gains his manumission and release through the law. Okay, so I think part of what's important here is essentially it's not just that the sultan is a slave, but it is important who owns him, right? This actually matters. Like, who does he actually belong to? The yeah, he belongs to the exchequer, right? And what did we note the exchequer is? What does this mean? What does it mean that he belongs to the exchequer? He belongs to the state. Yeah, he belongs to the state, right? And if he belongs to the state, by extension, he belongs to. The people. Yes. Now, I think that part of the argument here is that this would be true. The ruler belongs to the people regardless of whether or not his legal status is that of a slave. Right? The argument here, I think, is that the leader, the ruler, should belong to the people. And this is a big part of the Cadi's legal arguments as well, right? 
that to not follow the law here is to defraud the exchequer, right? That is essentially to pull a fast one on the people. And I think if we look a little bit further, we get a better sense, I think, of what the vizier actually wants here. Right, if we look at the bottom of page 345, can you get the vizier to read uh, from, then why don't we ourselves undertake this duty, you and I? Uh, near the bottom of the page. It's the fourth last, like, section, like, character. Yeah. Lines. Oh, then why don't we ourselves take this duty, you and I, and rest some of our sultans securely with our own money, and gain this honor, it is not an appropriate idea. I'm afraid not. It cannot be a secret. The law is specific in that it lays down that every sale of the properties of the egg striker must be carried out publicly and in general auction. Don't trouble yourself with him. He's determined to disgrace us. The last night, he there is, there, is there no stag stratagem. No stratagem for extracting us from this impetus. A stratagem? I am not the person to ask to look for a stratagem. Naturally. This man looks only for what will provoke and humiliate us. Not I as a person, your majesty. As a person, I as a person and weak and have nothing to do with the whole matter. If the matter were in my hands and depends upon my wishes, I would like nothing better than to extricate you from the situation in the best manner you could wish. Okay, so let's pause here for a second, right? So let's like focus for a minute on the word stratagem. Right, what is a stratagem? Think about words that it sounds like. Strategy. Yeah, it sounds similar to strategy, right? And what is a strategy? Plan. Yeah, a strategy is a plan, right? So a stratagem is a kind of a smaller element of that, right? So a stratagem is something like a trick. So what is the vizier? ultimately want to get them out of this? What does he want the Qadi to give them? A trick. Yeah. Okay, there's got to be some kind of tricky little loophole here, right? There's got to be something we can do, you know, you and I putting our heads together to get us out of this situation without anyone getting embarrassed. And the Qadi keeps telling him that no, there is no trick here, right? You can't get out of this by a trick. The only ways you can get out of this are by exercising your arbitrary authority or by submitting yourself to the law. So <clears throat> the Sultan lays out the lays out the dilemma for himself on page 345 here, right? He says, then what's to be done? This man puts us in a dilemma. He makes us choose between two alternatives, both of them painful. The law, which shows me up as weak and makes a laughing stock of me, or the sword, which brands me with brutality and makes me loathed, right? So he's seeing both of these possible choices as bad, right? There is no good way out of this. He's going to come out looking bad no matter what he chooses. So the choice here then is going to be like which is going to have other potential benefits, right? 
Now, as he talks about the sword on the next page, on page 346, can I get you, James, to read this? Look at this old man. Do you see him carrying a sword in his belt? Look at this old man. Do you see him carrying a sword on his belt? Of course not. He carries nothing but a tongue in his mouth with which he turns words and phrases. He's good at using the acumen and skill he possesses, but I carry this. It's not made of wood. It's not a toy. It's a real sword and must be useful for something. It must have some reason for its existence. Do you understand what I'm saying? Answer. Why was it ordained that I should carry it? Is it for decoration or for action? For action. And you, Cody, why do you not answer? Answer. It is for decoration or for action? For one or the other. What are you saying? I am saying for this or for that. What do you mean? I mean that you have a choice, Your Majesty. You can employ it for action or you can employ it for decoration. I recognize the undoubted strength possessed by the sword, its swift action and decisive effect, but the sword gives right to the strongest, and who knows who will be the strongest tomorrow. There may appear some strong person who will tilt the balance of, the, of power against you. As for the law, it protects your rights from every aggression, because it does not recognize the strongest, it recognizes right, and now there's nothing for you to do, your majesty, but choose between the sword which imposes and yet exposes you, and between the law which threatens and yet protects you. Okay, so stop here, right? As we, you know, as the sultan is, you know, literally preparing to draw his sword here, right? And make clear that particular choice. What... <clears throat> What does the sultan argue the purpose of the sword is? Why does he have why does he carry a sword? Well, I mean, he was asking at one point if it was for action or decoration that he yeah. felt it was for action. Yeah. Why carry a sword if you're not going to use it, right? Mm -hmm. And what is a sword? Yeah. A means of protection. Mm -hmm. Or a means of aggression, or right? A means of aggression. And I think that what he's talking about here is the weapon as a means of aggression, right? As a means of imposing his will on other people, right? Why should I, you know, why should I carry this if I'm not willing to use it? And then what does the Qadi argue? against this, right? Does the Qadi think that the sword has to be used for action? It can, in fact, just be a decoration, right? It can be a symbol of your authority. But better that you never actually have to put it to use. Right? Because if you are putting it to use, if you are building your rules solely on the strength of your arm and on threats, then what danger does that expose the Sultan to? Can you repeat your question? If the Sultan is basing his rule solely on his physical strength and uh, on threats, right, what danger does that expose him to? Okay, yeah, if the if something, you know, if something tests his strength and he fails, right? Mm -hmm. Then he's weak in the eyes of everyone and he's ripe for uh, removal, right? Um, this also means that, you know, if, you know as, as the Kadi puts it here as well that if somebody stronger comes along, they can just as easily take from him what he's taken from others, right? So rule by force only recognizes whoever is the strongest right now. And this is something also, keep that idea in mind when you read Hobbes for next time as well. 
Um, a lot of what he's talking about centers on ideas like that. Whereas rule by law recognizes the rights of everyone, right? That yeah, the law may embarrass you in certain situations like this one, but it ultimately protects you from people trying to knock you down or to take what you have. And the Sultan's choice ultimately is, after some deliberation, is the law, right? He's like, okay, I'll subject myself to the law and to the people. And yeah, I think that the, the basic argument of the play, which again, this is only about four or five pages of a much longer play, um, is to try to turn away from the path of arbitrary authority and suspension of rights and um, military dictatorship and back towards these kinds of, you know, uh, these ideals of a, of a republic um, where things are done for the public benefit out in the open. So does anybody have any questions about this? We're about out of time. Okay, so Thomas Hobbes for next time, right? We're gonna be dealing with a lot of the same issues, and indeed, like, we've been dealing with a lot of the same issues in Confucius and in Tacitus as well, right? So um, hopefully, like, we can start kind of tying some connecting points together when we talk about Hobbes next time.